Okay, my friends, the Holy Spirit's really laid this on my heart to put this video out. I've shared in mass of what I'm taking portions out of to make it more palatable so it's not going to be a five-hour video. But I've shared these documents all around the entire globe. I've surfed the internet. I've found material of that has been that I've seen where other people have, have done digging and then I've done digging myself and I've just compiled a big mis, uh, mishmash mash of all this stuff and this is urgent this, this one of the biggest problems in the church today and people say it's not important but it's very very important is on the topic of the rapture it's extremely important because if you got the rapture wrong you lose hope you lose joy you lose faith and it affects the church in terrible, terrible ways. And people try to make light of it and try to say, well, my version of the rapture is right and it doesn't matter about this or blah, blah, blah. It does matter. I'm going to share with you, out of God's Word, along with some very, very good commentary that shows you exactly, exactly, exactly when the rapture is. As far as date, don't know, but the actual rapture itself, whether it's pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, this settles all arguments from Scripture. There's no arguing the Holy Bible. There's no debating Scripture. I don't want to hear about healthy debates. The Bible's written the way it's written. The reason why most Christians can't understand it, they don't have the Holy Spirit in their hearts anymore, and they're trying to read with human eyes. The Holy Spirit has to read the Bible for you. So I'm going to break it down for you in a way that even a grade school child can understand. If after listening to this video, you have any doubts whatsoever about when the rapture is, A, you're not a Christian, or B, you used to be a Christian, you're backslidden, and you have zero discernment. You have the discernment of a pebble laying out in a stream somewhere. So I don't like to do a lot of reading. <laughs> it gets tiresome, but I have to. I'm going to break this down for you. I don't know what I'd be able to, to share, but I've got, I've got even more than this. I've got lengthy, lengthy documents. If, if this whets your appetite, message me. I'll send you all the rest in the complete form. But I'm, I've got it here where it's more palatable, but it hits all the, the, the spots and lets you know exactly when the rapture is. Let's start reading, shall we? Okay. Proof that the rapture is pre-tribulation is hidden in the timing of the two witnesses. The evidence for this becomes clear as we investigate the question of when the two witnesses' ministries begins, during the first half of the tribulation or during the second half. The seven-year tribulation period comes from the prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9 where each week is a time period of seven years. The tribulation period is the last or 70th week of that prophecy. This prophetic week is divided into two halves, each three and a half years long, from Daniel 9.27. It needs further to be said that those years are not our familiar calendar years of 365 and a quarter days each, but are actually Jewish lunar years of 360 days each, where each month is exactly 30 days. That being said, each half of the tribulation period is 1,260 days long, the same number of days as the ministry of the two witnesses. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth, Revelation 11.3. Now concerning the number of, of 1,260 days, I do not believe the sameness of half the tribulation period and the ministry time span of the two witnesses is a coincidence. Some students of Bible prophecy think the two witnesses 1260 days of ministry is aligned with the first half of the, of the trib, while others believe it aligns with the second half. This latter view is primarily due to Revelation 11, 3 to 13, which is the entire story of the two witnesses being found between Revelation 9, 13 to 21, which describes the second woe, i.e. the sixth angel trumpet judgment in Revelation 11, 14 to 19, which describes the third woe, i.e. the seventh angel trumpet judgment. However, some careful thought will show that the 1260 days of the two witnesses' ministry cannot possibly be anywhere time-wise in the second half of the tribulation. First, consider the nation, the nature of the exact way that God uses numbers. When he says 1260 days, he don't mean 1261, or 1259. When dealing with these tribulation time figures, we will find them expressed differently in Scripture, but they are all exactly equivalent. There's a time, times, and time and a half. Daniel 17, 25, 
which is repeated in Revelation 12, 14, and also defined for us in Revelation 12, 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that she would, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. That's Revelation 12, 6. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Revelation 12, 14. From this we know a time, times, and a half time equals 1260 days. Likewise, the time of the reign of the Antichrist is given in Daniel 7.25 as a time, times, and a half a time. It is repeated in Revelation 13.5 as 42 months. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One. He will intend to make alterations in times and in law. They will be given unto his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Daniel 7.25 There was given him a mouth, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Revelation 13.5 By this we know the Antichrist reign in Revelation 13.5, 42 months is exactly 1260 days, not a day more, not a day less. In Daniel 19.27, from which we've already seen, we have a seven-year length of the tribulation period, we find the Antichrist committing the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation is an act of sacrilege in which he enters the temple of God and puts a stop to Jewish worship sacrifices and demands to be worshipped as God himself, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 we know from Daniel that this event occurs in the exact center of the tribulation's seven years. But in the middle of the week, i.e. the one prophetic week equals seven Jewish calendar years, lunar years, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Daniel 9, 27. The abomination of desolation makes the temple of God desolate. Please carefully note the Antichrist will continue his reign until he's destroyed. This can only mean the Antichrist, who we have seen reigns for, 30, for 42 months, is destroyed according to God's decree at the 1260th day of his reign. Not one day more, not one day less. This destruction of the Antichrist is revealed in Revelation chapter 19 at the second coming. There the Antichrist and his associate in evil, the false prophet, are dealt with in finality. These two were thrown into the lit thrown alive into the lake of fire, Revelations 19 and 20. Now you might say, okay, so the Antichrist is destroyed after reigning exactly 1260 days. So what's that got to do with the time of the ministry of the witnesses, of the two witnesses? I'm glad you asked. In Revelation 11, after revealing the effects and nature of the two witnesses ministry, it records for us, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Revelation 11, 7. We are further told the two witnesses' bodies will lie in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days. Revelation 11, 9. Revelation goes on to say, But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and fell, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. Revelation 11, 11. For argument's sake, let's assume the ministry of the two witnesses really is aligned with the second half of the tribulation. Follow with me the sequence, the time sequence, based on that assumption. At the tribulation's period's midpoint, the Antichrist commits the abomination of desolation. That same day, the ministry of the two witnesses begins, and they minister for the ordained 1260 days, not one day more or less, which is also the exact length of the Antichrist reign. Then, on the final day of the Antichrist reign, he kills the two witnesses, but Jesus comes back right then also and has the Antichrist and false prophet thrown into the lake of fire. Despite this world-shaking event of the second coming of Christ, the world nonetheless watches the bodies of the two witnesses for three and a half more days, even while Jesus is judging the nations, Matthew 25, 31-46, and setting up his kingdom. Still, following that time sequence, after those three and a half extra days, the bodies rise to life again and there's a great earthquake. Revelation 11.13 
Then the third woe occurs, Revelation 11, 14, meaning the next angel, the one with the seventh trumpet, blows his horn, Revelation 11, 15 to 19. And that's not even counting the seven bowls of wrath that additionally follow the seventh trumpet. All this is happening three and a half days after the second coming. Does anyone besides me have a problem with this? <coughs> it's simply a fact that the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls all are completed before the second coming. The time of the two witnesses' ministry cannot be in the second half of the tribulation period. Even if we allow that the revelation passage of the two witnesses is isolated time-wise from the progression of the sixth and seventh trumpet, which in fact it is, we still can't have the time of their ministry in the second half. The world rejoices and gloats over the death of these two men of God and gives gifts to one another in a satanic celebration during those three and a half days. Revelation 11, 9 to 10. Something that would, have, that would have to be happening while Jesus has already returned to earth. Does anyone seriously expect that Jesus, then returned to earth in his power and glory as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, would allow that? <laughs> no way. So that's that's just plain common sense, my friends. And I need to I need to thank a guy uh, named Paul Kukorek, who did the research on this first topic that I put out. So let's go ahead and go to the next one. Let me see if I can find. I'm wondering if I should. Uh, where are we at here? I want to make sure I don't miss anything that I need to be putting out. I want to make sure it's totally, totally, totally where it needs to be at. Okay, let's go ahead and go through another thing with the two witnesses at the second half. With the pre-tribulation rapture happening, billions of people will suddenly have no one to tell them about Jesus. The Christians will all be gone. However, with the time of the two witnesses ministry beginning on day one of the tribulation, people will be hearing about Jesus despite the disappearance of Christians and the rapture. I believe it is the ministry of the two witnesses that brings to faith the 144,000 male Jews of Revelation 7, 1 to 8. These Jewish men finally believe in Jesus and realize that the time is short, and while the two witnesses minister to Israel, the 144,000 spread out all over Gentile nations to share Jesus Christ. Someone has compared it to letting out 144,000 Apostle Pauls loose on the world at one moment. And why in the world would God have Jesus take the church out if, if, the, if the rapture is post-tribulation and the church is already here, the church, since Jesus went back to heaven after he died and was risen again, the church has been the witness for Jesus Christ. We've been the one who've been fulfilling the Great Commission. So if we're already here on the earth fulfilling the Great Commission like we have for the last 2,000 years, why in the world would God want to bring two witnesses to do the jobs that we're already doing? See, that's what I'm trying to say, my friends. There's just absolutely no way that anyone can see anything other than the factual pre tribulation rapture. All right, let's go to the next to the next part here. First of all, note the 24 elders who represent the church are seen by the Apostle John in heaven, not on the earth sitting on thrones, not on the earth. They are sitting on thrones. They're wearing crowns on their heads. They're clothed in white raiment, all which is proof that they have been resurrected, resurrected translated, and rewarded. It's completely incongruous to conceive of a disembodied spirit crowned and rewarded apart from the resurrection and the rapture. Therefore, it's a fact. The rapture has already taken place. Secondly, note in chapter 5, these elders watch with great interest as the Lamb of God takes the sealed book of divine judgment from the hand of the one who sits on the central throne. To close the chapter, John sees them singing a song of their own redemption and adoring the Lamb as the one who alone has the right to hold the book. Thirdly, Note that all these events take place before a single seal of the book of judgment is broken, before a single trumpet of judgment is sounded, and before a single bowl of divine wrath is poured out on the earth. Hence, chronologically, chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation take place before any of the terrible judgments described in chapters 6 to 19 are poured out on the earth. 
This is imperative to understand the facts of this. Chapter 4 and 5 constitute an introductory vision to the events which are about to happen. Chapter 4 concerns the setting up of a special throne of judgment for the tribulation, and chapter 5 describes the little book and its seven seals. The breaking of the first seal ushers in the first judgment. Therefore, the events of these two chapters must precede the great tribulation and its scenes of judgment because it is from the things here pictured that the judgments proceed. Now, regardless of what you do with chapters 6 through 19, these arguments prove a, a pre-tribulation rapture. Regardless of the chronological interpretation you may make of the judgments in Revelation 6 to 19, whether you adopt recapit recapitulation or overlapping scheme, shuffle the seals and trumpets and vials as you will, you cannot push chapters 4 and 5 into the picture which follows in chapters 6 to 19. There is no judgment until the first seal is broken. The first seal is not broken until the Lamb receives the sealed book. The Lamb does not take the book until there are 24 are in heaven, sitting on thrones and with crowns on their heads. If the scene in heaven described in chapters 4 and 5 does not precede the judgments of chapters 6 to 19, then no man can make any sense whatsoever out of the order of things in the last book of the Bible. And the Bible is always very clear, my friends. So, we have this beautiful symbol, a clear reference to the church, has been raptured prior to the tribulation. There's no doubt about it at all. Zero doubt. Whereas we're certain this won't convince any, everyone because many aren't led by the Holy Spirit, we're putting the word out because it's blessed truth and needs to be shared. <coughs> now, last section. I hear the naysayers who say the last trump is the same trump that the seventh angel blows in Revelation, but they fail to understand that Paul was speaking of a last trump associated with Feast of Trumpets. Paul steps it up a bit in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 5, <coughs> starting with verse 1 to 9. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. So cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day shall overtake you as a thief. Ye are, are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. How much clearer can Paul say it? Do you think that the coming of the Lord, when he comes to rule on this planet for a thousand years, will be preceded in secret? Do you think that he will come when they expect it not? Paul talks of sudden destruction as a woman with child in child labor that will not escape the pain and the, or the delivery of the baby. What fits this scenario? A sudden, without warning, snatching away of children of light to the horror of the children of darkness. Or would it be more plausible for them to be going about business as usual in the very run-up of the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ in the clouds of glory with great power, with about five billion people being consumed, dead bodies all around, animals eating the corpses of those slain, and a carnage of divine retribution, would it be business as usual? Let's examine the signs of the final appearing, shall we? Business as usual? The answer is obvious. Revelation chapter 8. Let's go to verse 6 to 12. And the seven angels, which have the seven trumpets, prepared for themselves to sound. And the first angel sounded, and there followed a hail, and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burned up, and all the grass was burned up. And the second angel sounded, it was a, whereas a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea had and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them <coughs> was darkened. And the day shone, not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. 
Then chapter 9. Let's go ahead and start with verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men who have not had the seal of God in their foreheads. Then verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had a trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for that for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay a third part of all men. Now, at the end of chapter 9, descriptions of the most detailed description of what will befall rebellious mankind until the seventh angel sounds his trumpet to unleash the final assault upon earth to turn them to repentance. But God knows they will not. Does this sound like Jesus coming back to earth as a thief? Will not men know that they are under divine retribution? Will the world that is present be nearly extinguished of all life from what it was prior to the beginning of the opening of the first seal as found in Revelation 6.1? Will men be going about business as usual? Will men's hearts be failing them with fear over what's coming on the earth? Luke 21, 26. Sheer terror will reign supreme, my friends. Does this sound like business as usual? Naysayers, ask yourself, does this sound like it was in the time of the days of Noah? Matthew 24, 37. Or does it sound like there was another time period prior to these events that addresses this more realistically and prophetically? Think on that a bit as I return to Paul addressing the Thessalonians. In Second Thessalonians, let me try to make some more room here on my <laughs> on my computer. Okay. After these verses, we believe that Jesus will forcefully, in fact, we know Jesus will forcefully remove his bride, according to Paul in First Thessalonians four sixteen to eighteen. And if we believe in any other teachings besides the pre-tribulation removal of the church through the rapture, let me drop something on you to think about. If the Great Tribulation all were required to take the mark of the beast, and all who do will be damned according to Scripture, right? If you refuse the mark, you will be killed either by the ruling beast power or the followers of his power. If the post-millennial view is correct, with all the environmental upheaval, the divine judgments, the loss of life of upward of two-thirds of the entire planet destroyed, leaving either the damned or the saved. Then when Jesus Christ breaks through the clouds and the saved are transformed into spirit beings and the ones with the mark of the beast are destroyed, my question is, who will enter the millennium in their mortal flesh? See the problem? There will be no one alive, no one in mortal flesh that has not been changed to spirit to even populate the kingdom of God and produce human beings of flesh as expressed in your Bible. The only teaching that makes sense is the coming of the Lord for his church prior to the tribulation. Then, the second advent of Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom for a thousand years in that order. Now I'm parched. All right, my friends, and again, don't come back Don't come back at me and try to tell me some cherry-picked verses that you found that have no backing, no logic. I gave you the exact word of God right from his word and commentary that will that just blows it away. And also I want to thank um, Jason Taylor for part of that as well that I just read. So here's the bottom line. What are you going to do? Are you going to keep believing the lies or start believing the truth? The rapture, I've proven, is 100% pre-tribulation, zero doubt, zero chance of anything else to believe. Don't come back and try to tell me otherwise because I'll just delete your comment and I'll just block you. I'm a watchman. I warn. I give you the word from God's word. <clears throat> and after that, my job is done. It's between you and the Lord. You believe what you want to believe? Just don't share it on my channel. Don't share it on my, on my Facebook or any, any other ministries. So here's the bottom line. If you've never been saved by Jesus Christ's precious blood, or if you're a backslider, you won't repent because you believe lies, I've got 250 scripture from the Bible. God's word. Not yours or mine. God's word. And those words, those scriptures all say, 
if you do not repent of your sins after you're saved, you won't step foot into heaven. I've got that also on a lengthy Word document with commentary. Message me. I'd love to send it to you. And I've done a video on that as well where I've broken down so many verses of that. So many verses. I might put it out again. It's been a long time since I've done it. I might even do a more lengthy one if, I, if my voice can handle it. But the rapture is imminent, my friends. Any second of any day, Jesus is going to break the skies. God said that no one knows the day and the hour. Not Jesus. Not the angels. Not man. Only God. But God said he would show us if we're watching, excitedly, waiting for the rapture. He'd give us a sermon to know the season. We're in the last moments of that season, my friends. The rapture is going to happen any second of any day. And if you're left behind, you think the world's bad right now? You hear the things I just described to you out of Scripture? It'll be seven years of hell on earth that makes today's terrible disease falling apart world look like Disneyland. The speed pass go to the front of the line forever. Make sure you watch my video, The Tribulation Survival Guide. I attach it in the top of comments of every video. It tells you what to expect if you're left behind, how to make it to heaven on your last chance. But why go through all that? Let's pray right now before your time runs out. Jesus, I know I've sinned. I've done bad things in my life, and I'm sorry. I believe you came to earth. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again on the third day, went back to heaven and be at the right-hand side of the Father to make a place for your children forever. Please forgive me of my sins. Wash my heart white as snow. Come live in my heart. Make me a new creature in Christ, child of the King. Your precious name I ask it. Amen. When you pray this prayer, Jesus says that all who come to me to ask shall be saved. When you get saved, you get a King James Version Bible. It's the living, breathing Word of God. It'll feed your spirit and soul. It'll you feed your body with food and water if you read it every day. Pray to Jesus daily. He loves you. He's your new best friend. He wants to talk with you every day. Get water baptized, being dunked under water like Jesus was as soon as possible. If you're sprinkle baptized, it doesn't count, my friends. Do it over again. Pray to be sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit by living for Christ, praying, reading the Bible every day. Take that King James Version Bible to church when the preacher speaks. Make sure it matches your Bible. If not, Walk out, find some more to worship, and lastly, repent, repent, repent. Make sure you repent of your sins after you're saved if you want to go to heaven. If you'd like me to pray for you for anything, from a terminal illness to a sick pet, anything in between, contact me. I have the gift of faith, mustard seed faith. Didn't earn it or deserve it, but praise the Lord when I prayed for it. He gave it to me. If you ask me to, I pray for you every day, expecting a miracle in your life. I know that God will perform that miracle if it's in His holy will. And if He does, all because of Him, my friends. Nothing to do with me. I'm the least in His kingdom a tiny fish in a huge ocean a slave for Jesus Christ. Please share this video with everybody that you know who believes in anything but a, but a pre-tribulation rapture. And that's going to be, sadly, most of the church. Because most of the church these days are spiritually blind, sadly. I love you all. I don't want to see anyone die and go to hell. That's why I do these videos. Because I love you. And even, <laughs> even those two trolls that always come right away and dislike my videos, I love you guys too. And all you do by doing that, it's made me pray harder for you. That you'd find Jesus as your Lord and Savior or stop being backslidden if you think you're a Christian. Let's get ready, my friends. For those who are truly ready, look up. Our redemption draweth nigh. I pray you have a blessed week. And get ready, my friends. The rapture's imminent. We fly soon. Take care.